Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. My name is Scott Miller and as you know, I serve as your host and interviewer each week. Today, I'm delighted to welcome to On Leadership the famed author, social scientist, if you will, expert on helping organizations penetrate their markets, Jeffrey Moore, the author of numerous books, including today's book, Crossing the Chasm, which almost everyone has read. If you're at any point involved in technology in your organization, our CEO, Bob Whitman, Required it as reading to the entire executive team. Our vice president, Matt Murdock, is Jeffrey Moore's number one fan in the world. Jeffrey Moore, welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership. Well, Scott, thank you for thank you for such a warm welcome. Glad to be here. Well, I would compliment you on your interior design, but you've told us you're joining us today from a hotel in California. Thank you for um, getting up so early, and we're literally delighted to have you as one of the many guests for the On Leadership series. Very excited to talk to the author of the book that literally, literally everyone at Franklin Covey has read because it's been required reading sometime in the last decade. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the support. You know, Jeffrey, there's two ways to write a best-selling book, right? One is to, you know, buy it in, buy your way in by, you know, launching with tons of fanfare and money and marketing and social media. And then there's the old-fashioned way, which is kind of back in vogue, which is to write a really resonant uh, research-based book that penetrates people's conventional thinking. That's what you did. Your book, Crossing the Chasm, uh, almost 30 years old, updated three times, sold over a million copies. Congratulations on the staying power of a book that is so piercingly relevant 30 years later, truly. Well, well thank you. I mean, I, th I think it's, just, it's a testimony to the fact that as long as there's gonna be disruptive technology or disruptive innovation, we're gonna have to deal with the dynamics of how, how uh, communities and markets absorb them. And so I think the frameworks have held up very well. As you may know, uh, the famed uh, professor and author Clayton Christensen is a member of our board of directors, a dear friend to many of us here. So uh, at Franklin Covey, we've been very fascinated and dedicated to this idea of you know, disruptive innovation. You've now updated your book three times. I love the newest intro because you talk about the need to make it relevant. Can you talk a bit about why you wrote the book and what some of the evolutions have been over the last you know, couple of decades as you've revised it to make sure that it's you know, piercingly relevant in terms of a lot of the examples? Well, okay, I, because the, the book, the, the, the argument and the frameworks haven't changed, but the examples did have to change. People, people learn by relating things to their examples. And so the first set of examples came from the, the 80s and uh, uh, they resonated with a lot of people until about 19, oh, I think it was around 1999, and a bunch of people are going, you know, with the internet, with all this new stuff, I don't, I don't think we should be talking about Apollo and DEC and whatever. We should be talking about more recent examples. So in 1999, we updated the examples again. And then it was kind of cute. Uh, at the beginning of the, uh, around 2014, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to start rethinking about how I want to do the, the, the fourth quarter of my football game. So what do I want to do with these assets? And I thought I should update it one more time. And so the third time, and by that time, by the way, college kids would say, well, I'll read the book, but I have no idea who these companies are that he's talking about. So that was the time, that, the third time we rewrote it, we wrote it with the SaaS company. So that's how I got back in touch with Salesforce, with Workday, Box, Dropbox, companies like that. And so um, each time, there's a little bit of a change. I mean, you know, the, the world isn't static, but it's remarkable to me that I didn't change any of the core principles of the book even though there was a pretty dramatic change in the kinds of companies I was talking about. So Jeffrey, the core of your book is illustrated on the front, right? Which is this model that you talk about called the technology adoption life cycle. And there's in a sense five profiles, if you will, all with different psychographic um, uh, uh, differences. Let's start there so everybody has a bit of a working knowledge. Would you take maybe a minute or two on each of these five psychographic profiles and talk about why they're so important to understand on this technology life cycle. Right, and, and just to, do, to give credit where credit's due, two predecessors of mine, Everett Rogers actually did the original work on the technology adoption life cycle. He called it the diffusion of innovation. And then I spent some time with a man named Regis McKenna who really reinvented high-tech marketing in the 1980s. And he was the one who brought the technology adoption life cycle into tech market. My addition was this thing called the chasm, which I'm sure we'll get to. But the key to the principle of this model is when you introduce a disruptive innovation into any community, it will self-segregate into these five adoption profiles, each of which, as you've said, has a different psychographic. 
So the very first adopters, we call them the technology enthusiasts. They are genuinely interested in technology for technology's sake. So they will, they will spend a lot of time with the technical team. They want to know how things work. They want to help in any way they can. They like to, be, they like to get beta copies or even alpha copies of technology. Um, they'll work with your bugs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I always think of it like Sheldon, Sheldon on, uh, on Big Bang Theory. Sort sure. of like pro, or it used to be Doc Brown from Back to the Future, but I'm dating myself. But anyway, so that's that first profile. Uh, they don't have any money. They can't actually affect change, but they can't. But what they do is they let everybody else in the community know whether this technology is real or not. Is this cold fusion or is this, you know, virtual reality? And where are we? So the second psychographic we call the visionaries. And these are the people who make the first big bets on a disruptive innovation. They know they're going first. They know it's not done yet. They're willing to put a lot of project resources behind it. They're willing to put their own skin in the game because their vision is if this technology does what I think it can do, it will change my industry and I will catapult myself to the top. So I'm Jeff Bezos. I'm going to completely reinvent, first of all, the, the book distribution industry and then consumer products and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Bezos is a classic visionary. Job, Steve Jobs is a classic visionary. Larry Ellison, Bill Gates, all of these guys were that. They were first and they, and they made dramatic changes. Those two constituencies, however, are a minority of the, of the, of the population in any community. The majority of the population is made up with the next two profiles. We call them the pragmatists and the conservatives. So the pragmatists are saying, look, this stuff is kind of amazing. It's, it's kind of works. It gets better as you go along. You don't want to be too early because you're going to have a bunch of stuff. And by the way, you might back the wrong company and they may go out of a business. And it's a lot of risk. So, so what you should do is keep your eyes sharp, you know, stay alert to the, to the category, but don't really jump in until other people jumped in too. So it's kind of like a junior high dance problem. You know, I'm going to dance when I see other people dancing. I don't want to be first. I don't, but also I don't want to be last. So, so go, stick with the herd with sort of the pragmatist model and, and be very pragmatic about, about it. So, you know, you don't expect that the world's going to change in, in, in 90 days, but you want to make sure you get good value and you want to manage things carefully, et cetera, et cetera. Set expectations, meet expectations. Uh, the fourth group are called the conservatives because they, by and large, don't get a lot of value from technology or, this, or disruptive uh, innovations. So they want, they want to be late to the game. They want, by the time they get there, they want all the bugs to be gone. They're going to want to spend a little bit less than the pragmatists because it's, the market's more mature. That's fine with them. The, their biggest concern is not to be so far, so late that they actually miss the party entirely. So, but they do not, they're, they're willing to wait longer than, than the, uh, uh, main, uh, the pragmatists. And by the way, what that does is that actually makes them a loyal member of the previous regime. So they're still on, you know, they're on Macintoshes when you switch to Windows, and then they're on Windows when you switch back to Macintoshes, but they're part of an installed base. And, and tech, particularly in this new era of services, is taking the install base and the churn and all those issues much more seriously. So the conservatives, who frankly were a neglected constituency in the era of product, have become a much more interesting constituency in the era of as a service. And then the final group we call the skeptics, and they just fund fundamentally think that technology is way overblown, way overvalued. They're, and so they, they just want to get the cheapest, most minimal thing they can get. And the point about those five, five groups is they have the way you sell to them, the way you support them, the way you engage with them is very different. And when you're bringing a technology to market for the first time, which is what Crossing the Chasm is about, you have to kind of take them on in sequence. And, and that, that, what that causes you to do is to have to change your strategy and your whole approach, really, as you go through that, that life cycle. And that's very strange because you get really good at selling to one group and all of a sudden you got to sell to the next group and you got to sell completely differently and what they're looking for your company is different. But it's a challenge. And that's where the crossing the chasm challenge came. So, Jeffrey, thank you for that. Before we go to the premise, which is, of course, appreciating the chasm, you talked a bit about the importance to communicate, to present, to market differently to the group to the left of the one that you're um, segmenting. Is that tend to be a common problem that uh, any organization, high tech mainly, tend to market similarly to all five groups? W what are some examples of a great organization that appreciated this, this curve and communicated differently to each of the five segments? Well, I think what, what happens is the, the, 
um, as a, a, often you bring in different leaders at different times. So typically the first group, the way you market to them, it's sort of, we call this the early market. And basically what you say is like, they say to you, we believe what you believe. So what you're looking for is evangelical leadership, a guy like, you know, you know Steve Jobs and Guy Kawasaki did a great job with the Macintosh and the whole guy's book, The Macintosh Way kind of tells that story. And it's how do you get that initial enthusiasm, that, that spark of enthusiasm going but it's basically preaching to the faithful and, and everybody else you kind of let sort of wait, wait, in the, wait in the wings. The crossing the chasm, now you're going to pragmatists. Pragmatists do not believe what you believe, but if you work with pragmatists who have very tough challenges that the current technology does not solve, we call them pragmatists in pain. And if you will absolutely directly address that challenge, then they will buy into you, not because they don't say to you, we believe what you believe, they say, we need what you have. But you gotta have the whole thing. We call it the whole product. And a lot of what Crossing the Chasm is about is targeting a specific use case with a specific customer and assembling 100% of the whole product. That was kind of that second thing. Now that's not evangelism. That's not, that's not creating a big vision. That's actually creating a very specific diagnosis with a very particular prescription. So, to different kind of person, different kind of salesperson, different kind of support, different focus on marketing. And then if, as you start doing use cases and you do more and more, and it's, you're following that same second model, and all of a sudden people say, you know what? This is infrastructure. This is, this is bigger than any particular use case. You know, this is a smartphone. We're gonna use smartphones for everything. We're gonna use Wi-Fi for everything. We're gonna use laser printers for everything, but whatever, whatever your area is. So that it creates a third one where people say, you know, it's not that we believe what you believe. It's not that we need what you have. It's much more like we want what they have. So we like what they have and we want, we want in on that. So, so everybody should have Wi-Fi and everybody should have a smartphone. We should all, you know, we should all have a, you know, uh, uh, we should all be messaging each other, texting each other, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that third one. And in that one, it's a big land, it's a kind of a land grab. I mean, basically the idea is during that phase, people install infrastructure, well, with who they, whoever they install it with, that's going to be, they're going to be part of their installed base, probably for the next decade or more. So it's a very big deal to win customers during that. We call it the tornado because there was a sort of this vortex. Man. So that's a third. And you want very competitive sales things there. And you want to get as many people into your install base. And you kind of cut corners on, on, on customer service because you're trying to jam everybody in all at once. So it's, it's, it's a little bit self-centered, it, it, but, but frankly, it's kind of the way the market works at that time. So the people that are good in a tornado are not good in the bowling. We put that the class in the gas, and they're not good in the early market, but they're really good in the tornado, and by the way, vice versa. And then the fourth one is actually your install base. And that but those are people who say, Well, I'm not sure that we that we're not believers, and we I don't know that we need what you have. And I don't even think we want what they have, but I think probably now we need what they have because this is the new infrastructure, and we got to get on it. And then and what they want is much more like a managed service, they want the whole they, they don't like technology. They want it all kind of taken care of them. They don't want it to be too expensive because they're not going to get a ton of value, but, but, but they want to play and, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll play along. So again, in that, in that group of people, you want people who are very good at customer experience. I mean, you, all the stuff we're hearing now about customer experience and user experience, we never had that before because, because the conservatives weren't that important, but now they're incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So, Jeffrey, the big premise of the book, obviously, is understanding this chasm and crossing it. Talk a bit about how you uncovered that and why that's so treacherous for so many. Well, it was happening at the time I was with working at this firm that Regis McKenna had called Regis McKenna Inc. And we had all these great launches. That's, that was kind of its, its, its sort of its core offer to, to the tech community. And we'd say, this is going to be the next Apple. This is going to be the next Tandem. This is going to be the next Intel. And then they kind of go off the radar. And you kind of go, well, 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 what happened? They had these great customers, what happened? And so what you realize retro retroactively was this transition from the visionaries to the pragmatists, when the curve was originally drawn, there was no chasm in it. It was just like one bell curve. And so what you realized was, no, you know what? What the visionaries' values are and what the pragmatists' values are, they're actually antithetical to each other. The visionary actually thinks the pragmatists are slow and probably not as smart as they are. And the pragmatists think the visionaries are dangerous and irresponsible. <laughs> and so instead of getting a nice transition from one group to the next group, you actually got a kind of a polarity. And the notion that you had to change, dramatically change your market development strategy from essentially preaching all the 
possibilities and all the optimism of the future to actually talking about a very painful problem. So you, it, was, it was kind of the marketing of optimism and now it was the marketing of pessimism. You have a dangerous health condition. We need to address that. That's very different than, you know, meditate and exercise and, you know, become self-realized. And so very different marketing uh, and, and, and not just marketing, the, how you focus your engineering, how you focus your customer support, uh, all very different. Jeffrey, there's a lot of reasons why people fall in the chasm. Is there like one piercing one that you find that if you were talking to the C-suite to say, here's some very specific things to get your hands around culturally, organizationally, strategically, what are some really great watch outs to kind of burn in our psyche? Yeah, a couple of them. So one of them is in the early market, you talk about yourself and it's because it's the technology and you're the bringer of the technology. When you're crossing the chasm, it's not about you. And it's even not about the solution. It's really mostly about the problem, which means you have to become an expert in the domain that you're going to serve. And that, that market is a small market. And so you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I founded, I, I, I want to change the world. And, 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 and you're saying, no, no, first, we just got to deal with this one problem. So the Macintosh was supposed to be the computer for every other, for the rest of us, right? When they crossed the chasm, it solved the graphic art department problem in the Fortune 500, mm -hmm. which was a very interesting problem about presentation development at that time. And it was a nasty one. And the Macintosh with, with Adobe, Post, uh, Adobe PostScript and the Aldous Page Maker, desktop publishing, they did a great, great job. But Steve Jobs, who was sort of the, the evangelist for the Macintosh is going, I didn't create a computer for the graphic arts department. I created a computer for the rest of us. So the, one of the problems is you, 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 these, these crossing the chasm markets, these very niche markets that have these sort of gnarly problems, they look like way too much work for way too little to capture. What you have to realize though is pragmatist decision-making is reference-based. And if you don't create a reference base of pragmatists, you can't get traction on the other side of the chasm. So, so it's a little bit, I, well, the analogy I like to use sometimes is it's like winning the New Hampshire primary. You don't get a lot of delegates when you win the New Hampshire primary, but you put yourself on the map and you make yourself credible for future primaries. That, that mindset of being able to go from a, a general, we are, the, we are the second coming of you know, whatever, to no, 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 we are a very specific prescription for a very specific uh, uh, condition, that's, that's hard for a lot of people to see so we can get their head around. Jeffrey, you also write to that point that crossing the chasm really requires an unusual degree of what you call kind of company unity. Talk a bit about how executive teams, leadership teams, for that matter, leaders at any level can be part of the solution crossing as opposed to part of the problem falling victim to. Yeah, this is important. You know, in my mind, I make a distinction between leaders and managers, and I think we need both a lot. But a manager is especially is someone who's designed to help sustain the current inertial momentum of the company and increasingly leverage it. And, and, that, and most of the value in the world is created by managing an existing trend in, in a good way. So management's incredibly important. But when you hit a turn in the road, that's when you need leadership because now you're going off of something you know very well, which you have good, good history for, you can forecast, you can manage, and you're going off road into an area where you don't know very well. And so this is where leadership's important. And, and, and just as lots and lots of data helps managers, Frameworks like Crossing the Chasm and Clay Christensen's frameworks and all these other frameworks, they're designed to help you lead. So, so this notion of, of, of leading is you've got to get the map. Everybody in the boat, you want them to row in the same direction. And, and the challenge when you, when you make any of these turns is people were rowing one direction, now you want to get them to row the other way. Well, if you only get half the people to change the way they're rowing, your boat's going to spin for a long time. So the role of a leader when you're crossing the chasm is to get everybody onto the new playbook. And so if you, and we, we use the frame, the word playbook, because we want to show there is an early market playbook. Hey, we've executed it. We did it great. Here's what it looked like. This is what success was. Here's the new playbook. Do you see how different it is from the old playbook? Can you see that you don't want to run the two together at the same time? We need to get onto the new playbook. And then the more specific you can be about the differences between the old and the new, the, the faster you get people through that change model. People want to win. They want to, they want to row the boat in the right direction, but, but they need clarity about, well, what are you asking me to do differently and how do I know I'm doing it? Jeffrey, in the book, you also coined a phrase called the evil Knievel effect of, you know, how do you 
employ that to cross the chasm. For our younger listeners, they may not be as aware of who Evil Knievel is. Uh, talk about who he is and explain that, um, that concept. Okay, we're now going back in time. But there was a guy named Evil Knievel who was a very sort of a rock star motorcycle guy. He was an event at county fairs and the like. And, and he, would, he would jump things with his motorcycle. He'd jump cars, he'd jump trains, whatever. And when he was going to jump the Grand Canyon, I think it was the Grand Canyon. Anyway, uh, he did. He got about halfway and it didn't, it, it didn't go. Uh, but the point is, sometimes people say, I just, I hate this idea of going to a niche market. I want to leap from the early market straight into the tornado. You know, I just want to go boom. And by the way, it's, you know, in the consumer market, you could argue that, that you, sometimes it feels like that did happen. Like you see an Instagram come out of nowhere or a YouTube come out of nowhere. You think, well, I'm not sure they were doing chasm crossing. And so one of the things we've learned is in consumer markets with very low risk, uh, where you can kind of essentially build an audience for free, the, the media model is really the, 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 the unpaid media model. Um, th there's not a chasm there. Chasms are, are really came from business to business markets where you have a group of people making a considered purchase that has risk associated with it. And that's when, that's when the pragmatist decision process of we're not going to do this until we federate the decisions and we, we see good references and we see things in production. All of that is what created the dynamic that says you have to change your strategy to cross the chasm. And the evil Knievel guys wanted to jump over all of that and just say, no, we're horizontal infrastructure. You know, we're for everybody. Everybody should just buy us. And the problem with that is it, it just it falls, it, it falls dead, on, dead on arrival. Jeffrey, you have our entire production crew captivated right now because most of our clients know Franklin Covey has moved from in the last, you know, four or five years from being what we think is one of the world's most, if not the most, reputable leadership development training consulting company. And we moved to become an intellectual property company where we now are a SaaS company, right? We've moved from being a kind of old school thought leadership firm to being a really high tech provider of uh, all of our solutions via our all access pass. So everybody's listening with great detail, thinking about how they fall into this um, chasm or not. Let's do a quick speed round. I'm gonna name some products, not by necessarily you know, consumer names, maybe I will. You kind of tell me where they fall on the technology curve, if you will. Um, what happened with QR codes? So QR codes is a good example of something that tried to do an evil Knievel. So basically the idea with QR codes was, and it was a takeoff from barcodes, you could, you could create a, 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 um, an interaction with, with something and, and you could essentially tap into a larger database to make it work. Um, it worked, first of the technology works. So, and, and the people who believe what you believe, got it. I don't think they found the crossing the chasm use case. They didn't find pragmatists that were enough in pain. So what happens when you don't do that is you try it, you try it, some people do it, some people don't. The cost of not doing it isn't that great. You know, it's like, okay, I didn't have QR codes, but that's not too bad. And so it kind of just fades away. So that's a classic one that died in the chasm. Let's talk about tablets. Uh, I own three tablets, right? Three iPads, but I don't own any pen-based tablets. Where would you describe pen-based tablets are in this? So pen-based, by the way, <laughs> In 1990, 90, I think, or 89, 90, there was a, that was the first pen-based computing uh, wave, right? It was, a good, it was a company called Go, there was a company called Momenta, there were company, all these companies. And, uh, it, it, and it was gonna be a big thing and then it kind of didn't go anywhere. So we thought, well, wait for the processing to go further. So pens have come back at various times, you know, the Galaxy, the Samsung Galaxy has a pen and, and but the latest, all the Windows, uh, 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 notebooks support a pen. I, this computer I'm on right now, if I, ha I have a pen in my briefcase, I never use it. Because again, I think the use case that makes it really compelling hasn't happened. I thought it was going to be taking notes on a tablet the way you take notes on a pad of paper. It, it just it doesn't, it has not happened. And I, and I don't think it's going to happen. And then somebody else said, well, maybe it's marking up presentations or it's doing you know, that kind of stuff. It's bizarre, but I think the, the pen is an artifact of, of, of the physical world. And, and, and I, other than graphic artists who deliberately overcome the issues, I don't think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's in the, I don't even think it's gotten to the chasm, frankly. How about virtual reality? I think virtual reality is, is a classic situation right now where it's got a very strong early market and it's looking for a chasm crossing 
use case. People are thinking, well, maybe it could be training field engineers with a complex, you know, maintenance problems where you could sort of virtually see the, 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 the design of the product overlaid onto the actual thing. I, I think it's kind of improbable. So again, um, I don't, I, 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 I think people have to find that prosthetic use case and I don't think it's been found yet. Uh, what happened to segways? It seems like I only see segways in airports with police officers and in big cities, maybe running like ghost tours or something. Where, where would you say segways ended up? <laughs> That's exactly, I mean, segways is like, it, it's, it's a classic example of something that, you know, did there was no pragmatist in pain. Doesn't mean you can't use one. Uh, because, for example, look at what really what, what, what happened with Segways really is the electric scooter. So the electric scooter is going to take over the city, and and basically it's just a different it's a different kind of Segway if you think about it. Yeah. Uh, Segway was being very clever about this about its, its use of a gyroscope, but that was as technology enthusiast, you know, do you believe what we believe kind kind of thing about gy gyroscopy. The convenience of getting around on a, on an electric scooter, on the other hand, which is Segway arguably you know provides. Um, is 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 that 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 in fact that one just like feels like it started in the tornado. Um, this notion of uh, and, and part of that was because it could it could build on the back of so many other things. The, the 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 company knows where all its scooters are all the time. The way that Uber knows where its Uber drivers are all the time. Well, that sort of thing wasn't available 15 years ago, but right. now it is. Right. You can pay for it. You can pay for it like you can pay for Uber on the scooter. I mean, so you don't have to like go to the scooter place. To, to, you just have to you know. Like you don't want don't want to trip over a scooter as you're in a city, so so I think um, uh, the Segway just was overly quirky uh, for and, and therefore missed the the horizontal opportunity. Um, I happen to live downtown Salt Lake City, and part of my morning ritual is moving all of the scooters off of my front yard into the street so they can come and collect them. Uh, fast forward 15 years, talk about Tesla. Where is Tesla? So Tesla did, I think, a brilliant job. So Tesla's first product, if you recall, was a Roadster. And it was just the idea, is it possible for an electric car to be a performance vehicle? And the answer was, you bet. In fact, what you now know about electric cars is they outperform gas cars dramatically because there's no clutch, there's no transmission. It's just boom, the, the, the zero to 60 is just like, you know, it's neck, neck popping. So that was, so, but it was still, that was an early market play. Their crossing the chasm play was with their Tesla, their high-end Tesla sedan. And basically, they, they weren't going after pragmatists and pain, to be fair. But they picked a, a use case for a particular kind of high-tech executive. So in Palo Alto and all around Palo Alto, which is where the Tesla factory started, Teslas were as common as, as Priuses. I mean, it was, it was like the Palo Alto Prius. And, and, and you would go to these enclaves of uh, where, where, where the technology people were strong or where the green movement was strong. And then the thing that, 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 that Elon did that was really remarkable that made it actually work was he committed to building recharging stations along frequently traveled routes. And this is something that, that, that no other car maker would have done. Uh, but, but, but he said, no, this is, we're gonna do this. We have charging stations. And that, that began to increase the, the range of it because now you could recharge going down uh, you, as you're going forward. And awkward at first, get, but, getting, but getting better. And then now the model, their third model, which they're having production problems with, and their, their challenge right now is I think they've crossed the chasm and the electric cars have crossed the chasm. You're now seeing the other car makers all have an electric car um, uh, future in, in mind. So it's, but we haven't quite hit the tornado yet because because you have to, to, to get into a broad horizontal uh, distribution at scale, you have to take all of the major friction points off the table. There's still some issues around, well, there's concerns about battery fires. There's concerns about, well, where can I recharge? How long does it take to recharge? You know, and, and when can I get the home recharger at a, at a, at, you know, in a more commoditized state? And maybe if I use solar backup batteries as part of it, maybe that make it more compelling for the homeowner. But, but, but Elon took the responsibility, I think with the charging station, it's a great example of taking responsibility, not just for your product, but for the whole product. And that's kind of the key to crossing the chasm. Jeffrey, the book is a masterpiece. I, I wanna spend the last few minutes on what is one of my favorite case studies in the book. I think it's called Documentum is the name of the company. Would you just take a few minutes and kind of walk our viewers and listeners through what are the insights to learn 
on the journey of Documentum. Okay, now this is a historical journey because basically Documentum's claim to fame was we're going to help digitize paper and, and particularly the management of, 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 of documents, which, it, which at the beginning were in file cabinets, right? And then they got, you, you'd make them digital, but then the question was, we, we didn't really have a document database. We didn't really, how, how do you handle all that stuff? And so, so the, and this was out, came, all came out of the Xerox uh, Park world. It was, it, was, it was incubated by Xerox. So at the beginning, uh, the company had gotten some early adopters. Uh, one of their early adopters was a company called uh, Syntex. And basically, they were in the drug uh, birth control drug. And they were using it to manage all of the documentation around new drug approval which turns out to be like a half a million pages. I mean, there's an enormous amount of documentation that you send to the Federal Drug, Drug Administration from all kinds of sources, from your labs, from the clinical trials, from I mean, history of everything, lots of stuff. They also got one from Boeing, and, and Boeing had been using it for aircraft documentation. So again, it's an enormous amount of documentation around an aircraft, and, 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 uh, and that was number two. And then the Marshall McClellan, who was a, an insurance company, said, you know, we think we can use this for a lot of our uh, uh, financial services. We can use this for a lot of our financial services documentation. And that's classic in the early market. The visionary customers come from many different industries. Each one sees your technology in a slightly different light for a problem that it can solve. So we were with, we were with the management team and we realized, okay, to cross the chasm, though, we got to pick one use case and we got to specialize in it for the next probably two years. So we, 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 went out, we went through that exercise and we built scenarios out for each for aerospace and for drugs and for financial services and a lot of other scenarios. But we picked, we picked the one for drugs. And the key thing there was the, the drug approval cycle works. It, the, a drug, when it's, pat, when it's patented and it's in market, it, it sells on the order of, you know, uh, 300 to 400 million dollars a year that, at that time. And so basically a uh, million dollars a day is kind of how you can think about it. And so uh, the drug approval process, it cuts into, uh, into your time in market with a patented drug. So you patent the drug, but it's not yet approved. You've got 17 years of patent life. So every day you waste in the approval process is a million dollars of lost revenue. And these approval processes were taking six to nine months. And so, and it, it, just to manage the paperwork, I mean, not to actually get the approval, just to get it all submitted properly. And so what Documenta was able to do is take that down to six weeks. And so the person, uh, the, the, the only person they were selling to is the regulatory affairs department of a drug company. It's a very, very small market. There's not that many drug companies. And basically, Syntex was their first one, and they got their second and their third. And by the fourth or fifth one, they got a call from a, from a, 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 a head of a, 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 a drug department in a company they've never called on. Said, "I don't know who you are, but I'm supposed to talk to you." And that's what happens when you, if you in a, with a successful crossing the chasm scenario, when you have a truly troubling use case. The people inside the industry have been talking to each other about it for a long time. About how God, what a pain in the neck this thing is. When somebody finds the new cure, the new magic medicine, the new whatever the heck it is, that word spreads quickly. And so the whole reward for focusing on a niche market is, A, you really do solve the problem, and B, they love you, and they tell all their friends, and you get the entire document, I mean, the entire market virtually immediately. Within, within, within 24 months, Documentum had 35 of the top 40 pharmaceuticals at a time when they were the challenger. FileNet with IBM was, 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 the, was the leading uh, electronic do, uh, document management system, but not in, in drug. Once they got the drug thing, then, uh, then they could go into adjacent use cases. So they actually went into other departments in the drug company. They went into the, the, like the manufacturing guys, have standard operating procedures. Uh, by the way, that's a process chemical plant. That, so then the process chemical guys that are not in drugs, they're, they're processing other chemicals. Well, we have standard operating procedures. We need this. Oil and gas said, well, you know, we have it. We need it. The oil and gas people said, you know, we lease a lot of land. We have a lot of paperwork with our leases. Maybe we should just document them for leases. Then the Wall Street guys heard about it. Marshall McLennan, we went back to financial services. I mean, eventually it did become horizontal, um, but, it, but it became horizontal kind of 
winning primary by primary by primary, and then they won the, then there was Super Tuesday, and then they won the Democratic nomination or the Republican nomination. And that was kind of how the, the thing played out. Uh, great example. Thank you, Jeffrey. Lots of uh, insights in my own mind around Franklin Covey's evolution as we, you know, uh, try to expand our footprint and reach with our clients. Tell me, you've mentioned this concept, the tornado. You wrote a book called Inside the Tornado. Unpack that concept a bit for us. Well, that's the just the chasm is the transition from the early market to the pragmatist in pain. And you can then build out what we, we call it the bowling alley, but, which, but what it meant was go from that first use case to adjacent use cases and use some of the same whole products, some of the same partners, some of the same references. So that's where the bowling alley leverage came from. But you're still essentially going niche to niche to niche. You're, you're island hopping uh, you know, through an archipelago. The tornado is when the market goes, they go from vertical to horizontal. In other words, they say, you, you've got a lot of use, use cases, but this is, this is for everybody. The, the, you know, we can use this across a broad set of use cases, including a whole bunch you've never heard of. And by the way, we don't want to buy them from you. We want to make them ourselves, or maybe we want to buy them from one of your partners. But but you need to make your thing much more horizontal. So this is all about we need you know in technology terms, this is I need APIs to your software. I need to be able to a platform. Maybe this is where you'll start hearing a ton about platform because I want to be able to build on top of what you're doing. I want to leverage your your customer base as well as your technical base, etc. So that was the tornado, and the key to the tornado was. Um, in the tornado, the category gets real momentum, and part of you, the way you see that is an ecosystem of partners starts forming around the technology, and it forms around the market leader. And there's a second group that forms around the number two company, and after that, it doesn't work. So in other words, if you're going to, and the ecosystem is what makes the company powerful. Your company, your company is powerful, not just for yourself, but for all the ecosystem of partners who leverage your, your company in their businesses. So it's very important to win the market share battle during the tornado, because if you can be number one or number two, you're gonna have a very strong future. And if you don't, it's not that you don't have a future, but you're gonna always be kind of a second class citizen in that, in that category. And so the tornado was all about how do you maximize the market share gains during that window when the technology adoption life cycle is essentially all the pragmatists are coming in. They've created their budget. Now they've created the RFPs. They're gonna buy whatever it is that you're selling. They don't buy it from you. They're gonna buy it from somebody else. That was very different from what you were doing before where you were trying to find the use case, meet the use case, whatever. Like the customer's coming to you. Uh, now, and, and so that, so winning that, that first RFP deal turns out to be a huge, a huge thing. Jeffrey, in our opening, I mentioned that On Leadership is the now the world's largest, fastest growing leadership newsletter podcast in the world. To the millions of business unit leaders, CEOs, COOs, CMOs that are listening or watching today, what's your call to action? What are some of the one or two or three very tangible things you want all of us to take away to, to figure out how to translate the concepts in the book into our daily directives and strategy? Well, I think all of us at various times are going to deal with some kind of disruptive innovation. It may not be technology. Right. It might be a business model. It might be a cultural change. It, it, but basically, it's going to be, I'm going to take the inertial momentum of my company or, or my enterprise and you know, from going north to going east or maybe even south. So, so the point about that is, so it's a leadership problem. It's not a management problem at this stage. And, and I think being able to, to orient people to saying, okay, we're going to make the turn. And then to realize in your population that you're leading, there are early adopters, there are pragmatists, and there are conservatives. And you need to sort of play the life cycle inside the constituency that you're trying to lead. So you do want to start with the people who believe what you believe, but don't fall in love with just them because they're the minority. And I mean, you know, when you go off in a brand new direction, most people think it's a bad idea. So, so you want to get the people who believe what you believe. And then I think the next thing you want to think about is of the people who are still hanging back, aren't there some who I can show the new path is going to make their life a lot easier in, in relatively the near future. And we'll give them extra support to kind of go to the new path because they're going to help us bring the next group and the next group. And then at some point when you realize the group is okay, we're going to go then it's really important to have the scalable systems in place that you can get every, that, because now you're gonna have a whole herd come in saying, okay, 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 where is it? And the problem is now you're gonna overtax 
your change management capabilities. So you got to be prepared to, to kind of onboard a, lot, a, a kind of a whole swath of people all at once. And then, and, then, and then don't leave the last half of your population behind, which we tend to neglect. The, the conservatives who are late to the party, we tend to say, well, you know, you didn't show up at the right time, or you have to use the same stuff that pragmatists used. Well, they're, they're, it's a different group of people. So, they, so change management has a sort of a, a, a life cycle associated with it, I think, in every part of our world. And, and so I would ask every leader to sort of be sensitive to the change management dynamics of the, of the population that you're trying to lead. Jeffrey, you've authored five or six books. This book has sold a million copies alone. What's next for you uh, on your writing and speaking? What are you thinking about right now? Well, it's great. So, so um, and what's next actually came out about three years ago, but it's, it's gonna be probably the next decade of my life, which is, it's, it's a book called Zone to Win. It's actually the crossing the chasm journey, but it's inside a large public enterprise instead of in a startup. So one of the, the simplifications of crossing the chasm is the assumption is you're a freestanding entity that's sort of creating its future. It's the kind of people we were dealing with at Regis McKenna, they were typically venture-backed companies. So there's a lot of challenges of working through the net life cycle. But one thing a startup has in its favor is it has no distraction. There's only one, if you give it another dollar, it's only one place to put it. And so, so everybody's rowing in the same direction. In a large public company, couple of things. First of all, you don't have any venture money. So if you're going to spend money on the next big thing, you got to take it out of the current big thing. And the current big thing wants investment. And the next big thing wants investment. And at some point, the, the next big thing needs a lot of investment. And you're, you're, what, what you realize is, I'm going to take money out of my most profitable business and put it into a highly unprofitable business. And, and, and what, but what was the good part? <laughs> and so, and you're, the public investors don't want you to do it. And, and the people who are succeeding with the old business don't want you to do it. And, and, and the new business isn't performing as well as you were hoping. And what it causes people to do is start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, and eventually lose, lose their way. So Zone to Win was say, and, and saying, look, we need a better playbook for this problem inside a public company. I've, it's been out for three years. It, again, like crossing the chasm, I, did, I don't do the big publicity thing. I just kind of let the book speak for itself or not. And this one, like crossing the chasm, and frankly, I've written seven books, but these, this is the only two that this has happened with. Uh, people are finding me. They're just saying, look, uh, yeah, this is kind of what we're doing, and we need to talk to you, and we want you to talk to our customers, and we want you to talk to us because we're all dealing with this change. Jeffrey, you do a lot of public speaking consulting. If someone wants to find you or connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, there's this website called jeffreyamore.com, originally uh, original name. And I, and I do a blog on LinkedIn uh, where I've got, I don't have 6 million followers. I have maybe 650,000 followers, but it's, 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 it's fun. Uh, so I say either one of those ways would be a way to get that. Jeffrey Moore, thank you for your time today. You joined us uh, on your personal time. You're traveling across the U.S. You're in California today. Such a great, tangible conversation for all of our listeners and viewers. Thank you for being such a, an inspiration, but really a practical leader. Uh, we're all going to leave today thinking really seriously around where do we allocate resources, how do we put our time, how do we row in the same boat, what to fund, what to defund. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, Scott, I, it's a privilege to be on your show, and thank you very much to you. The honor is ours. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Wow, what a conversation with Jeffrey Moore. The book is Crossing the Chasm. Pick up a copy, including one of the other six that uh, Jeffrey has written. And we'll see you back here next week on Leadership. If you're not subscribing, do so by visiting franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership button. It's a free weekly newsletter. comes out every Tuesday morning via email, opt-in only. Yeah, there's no cost to it. It includes an interview just like today's with Mr. Moore, as well as a downloadable tool from Franklin Covey's vast leadership library and a blog article written by me about the topic that we discuss. Sign up your friends, your family, your entire division. We'd love to have you be part of Franklin Covey's on leadership community, and we'll see you next week.